Carlo Rovelli has written many books now uh, explaining physics, the nature of time, the nature of space, and a range of other scientific concepts to ordinary people. And his latest book is called Helgoland. Out this week, Carlo Rovelli, Helgoland, and it's about quantum mechanics, another area of physics, and one where he takes the opportunity to explain not only the origins of quantum mechanics, but also something of its mysterious meaning, at least as well as he can, or you, anyone can understand the meaning of a complex and difficult thing, which uh, Richard Feynman once said, that if anyone says that they understand quantum mechanics, that just goes to show they don't understand it. Carlo Rovelli does a pretty good job, though, at introducing the subject to us and trying to make some sense of it. It's designed for the layperson. You don't need any understanding of quantum mechanics to understand the story. It's called Helgoland because Helgoland, or as we might know it in English, Heligoland, uh, a rock of an island just out in the North Sea, was the place where quantum mechanics really began. There was the originator of it, a young man called uh, Werner Heisenberg. And he was seeking to solve a problem which had been set to him by Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr had been able to calculate some of the, the ways in which electrons moved in orbits around the atom and the way in which it gave off certain characteristic light signals when it was stimulated. No one seemed to know why it was working that particular way. Many people have tried to understand the new mechanism which would enable um, the, the orbits to maintain the position that they were in. But it took Heisenberg the opportunity to, uh, to sit alone on Helgoland to work it out. Let me read to you the opening chapter, which is the first is a quote from Heisenberg himself in his own writing. He said, It was around three o'clock in the morning when the final results of my calculations were before me. I felt profoundly shaken. I was so agitated that I couldn't sleep. I left the house and I began to walk slowly in the dark. I climbed on a rock overlooking the sea at the tip of the island and I waited for the sun to come up. And Raffelli says, I've often wondered what the thoughts and the emotions of the young Heisenberg must have been as he clambered over that rock overlooking the sea. The barren, the windswept North Sea island of Helgoland facing the vastness of the waves and awaiting the sunrise. And after having been the first to glimpse one of the most vertiginous of nature's secrets ever looked upon by humankind. He was 23. And Ravelli goes on to explain what it was which was the insight that Heisenberg had. It was an insight which basically is the same insight that Einstein had. The insight of not proposing things which you cannot observe and sticking fixedly and firmly to what you know to be absolutely certain and true and not to import other ideas. So Einstein stuck very firmly to the idea of the velocity of light being an absolutely fixed and unalterable speed at which you can't go beyond. He also fixed on the idea that inertial frames, the idea that the physics happens um, exactly the same in a way which you cannot distinguish from any other way, whether you're moving in a velocity or whether you are stationary. Everything else, the ether which was imported, was jettisoned, thrown out. Heisenberg took the same approach. The same approach was that you don't talk about things which you cannot observe. Let me read another section from the book to explain this. Heisenberg's leap is as daring as it is simple. No one has been able to find the force capable of causing the bizarre behaviour of electrons. Fine, let's stop searching for this new force. Let's use instead the forces we are familiar with, the electric force that binds the electron to the nucleus. 
And if we cannot find new laws of motion to count for Bohr's orbits and his leaps, fine. Let's just stick with the laws of motion that we're familiar with without altering them. And let's change instead our way of thinking about the electron. Let's give up describing its movement. And let's describe instead only what we can observe. That's the light which it emits. Let's base everything on quantities that are observable. And that is the idea. That's the revolution that occurred on Helgoland in 1925. He goes on to talk about um, the way in which this idea has led to astonishing predictable results from the quantum theory, a theory which has never been proved to be wrong, but also a theory which has never properly been understood. Born, uh, another character in the story, brought into play the idea that um, what quantum mechanics is talking about now is probabilities. The probability of finding an electron over here or over there. But it tells you nothing about how it gets from here to there. That's the bit that you don't see. You only observe it being here or you observe it being there. So that's all that can be talked about. Of course, people want to understand more than just what you can observe what's actually happening in reality, what's going on behind the scenes. And Ravelli takes some time in the second part of his book, because the first part of the book is about the discovery of quantum mechanics. The second part really is about the various interpretations, the curious bestiary he calls of extreme ideas. He deals with the problem of superposition, that very strange idea that things can be both alive and dead at the same time, because a wave function can be in existence to represent that which is alive and dead, and in a superposition of states means that both exist at the same time. Rather like two strings on a guitar, which can both be plucked and both sound a note at the same time, even though it's a different note, and yet the harmony of those notes is something which is considerable. Ravelli takes his time in taking us through the various different interpretations of quantum mechanics. He looks at the hidden variable theories of Bohm. He looks at the many worlds theory of uh, Everett and Wheeler. He looks at the Copenhagen interpretation of Niels Bohr and other ideas too. But what he does most of all throughout the book and particularly in the third and final part of the book is talk about his own interpretation. It's a, an interpretation based upon relations. It's the relational interpretation of quantum mechanics. And if you ask me what I think of it, I would say it's got something going for it. It's based upon the simple idea that nothing exists in reality except relationships. That objects don't exist, only relations exist. It's an idea that goes back to Ernst Mach, who said that everything is based upon relations. And it may be even further to some of the Eastern philosophies have also said a similar thing, and he draws some parallels with that too. But the idea is that if relationships are the heart of reality, then quantum mechanics is only describing relationships. So things don't exist in and of themselves, and only the relationships between the things exist in reality. Now, that has some profound consequences for Ravelli and for the rest of us because it basically means that we don't exist as individuals as such, as I understand him rightly, but our relationship to things is what gives us some meaning and reality. Our relationship to the sun is what warms us. Our relationship to sound is what causes hearing. But on their own, by themselves, these things are, are nothing. Only when they're in relationship to, to something else does reality have a hold on those items. So, a book which will make you think, and a book which will help you to understand at least some of that difficulties which um, Richard Feynman says 
no one really understands it. Maybe we've got a little bit closer with relational quantum mechanics. I'll leave you to find out. But there it is, Carla Ravelli, Helgoland. A new book published by Alan Lane and the cost of £20. Uh, money well spent. <laughs>